we'll talk about your, uh, uh, your neural system, your neurons. Okay, so uh, endocrine system is the slower one. It's bloodstream, it takes longer to get there, generally speaking, and it takes longer to go away. Uh, neurons, the most part are, uh, at least as far as our perception goes, uh, instantaneous. So, um, we talked about it yesterday. What is the way in which neurons communicate with each other? That makes this so quick, right? There's a reason why the hormones go slowly and the neurons go quickly. Yeah, electrochemical, right. So it's electricity uh, and chemicals. It's a combination. Oops. All right, so you have uh, the two elements here. The first part, obviously <coughs> electricity, or at least static. Uh, the charges of ions, which I'll show you briefly. It doesn't really matter that much. Well, it doesn't matter. They have had a couple questions about it before. But I'm not super concerned with you know, like every detail of how a neuron fires, but you should have a basic understanding of how it communicates. So you've got the electricity, which we'll talk about. Um, and then you've got the, uh, the chemical portion. And we call these, and this is a real name, I, I definitely need you to know this one, uh, a neurotransmitter. All right. Uh, those are the chemicals uh, with which your brain communicates. Uh, the neurons in between them send signals to the rest of your body, takes in information, and it's also what uh, allows us to feel. So when you feel happy or sad or excited or alert or tired, or etc., cetera, um, it could be hormonal or it could be a, a, neurochem a, chemical, a neurochemical, a neurotransmitter. All right, so uh, for example, um, the four common ones, yeah, we'll talk about the four common ones. There's a bunch. Uh, there's, uh, I don't remember the exact number, but there's, there's a lot. It's, it's more than 40. I think I might have the number wrong, but we'll, we're just going to talk about like the primary four. I don't think we'll ever talk about more than these four in this class. So neurotransmitters, you've got, you may have heard of some of these. Um, one of the common ones is dopamine. That's your reward uh, center, uh, your, your neurochemical that you experience reward with. So those are the positive feelings. Um, so. When you uh, bite into, let's say you like brownies, most people like brownies, whatever your favorite brownie is made by whoever your favorite baker is at the time at which it is most tasteful to you, whether it's just out of the oven or a day later or whatever, you take a bite of it. It feels sweet. You get the, the, the fat and the sugar on your tongue. It tastes good and whatever. Um, so that's good. But uh, it actually will perk your mood a little bit, which is why people, when they're not feeling uh, well, when they're low energy, when they're uh, depressed or whatever, they'll actually turn to food um, whatever their favorite fruit is, to sort of boost their mood temporarily. And the reason why that's occurring is uh, dopamine, all right? And that's what makes you feel uh, positive and good and elated and, and happy and all of that. Uh, it, it perks your mood up, right? And that's actually a chemical. So your feelings aren't like this mystical thing where the sensation from some other part of the universe comes in and taps into you and you're channeling it. No, it's really just chemicals. Uh, and we can actually... Uh, uh, Simulated too. That's what drugs do. Uh, drugs take these neurochemicals we like, these neurotransmitters, and they uh, simulate them. All right, so they make our brain think that uh, it's dopamine when it's not, uh, or it causes a surge of dopamine um, synthetically. So that's what drugs do. We'll talk about drugs in unit three, maybe five. I can't remember what unit it is, but we'll talk about that later. But that's kind of what they do. So this is my uh, reward neurotransmitter. All right, that's my happiness, alertness, well not alertness, but happiness, uh, positivity. This is what people generally like. Um, and this, by the way, anytime you're feeling good, like let's say you accomplish a goal, like you're like, oh man, I got to get the speech, you're all nervous about it, you work on it all night, uh, you prepare a good speech, you go up, uh, maybe it's difficult, but you do it, and afterwards you're like, oh, I did it, I think that was good, that was, that was a good job, um, uh, I, I communicated what I wanted to, uh, everything went well, all my hard work paid off. Are you gonna feel good if you have those thoughts? You are, right? And that good feeling actually comes from uh, uh, your dopamine. All right, and that actually drives our uh, decision making and planning, because most of the stuff we do that's important uh, doesn't actually affect us in that moment, um, like grades, for example. Right, the uh, grades you get, that you don't get them all on that instantaneous day. You study for a day when you take that quiz or test or whatever, and the results are sometime in the future. Uh, and our ability to plan and feeling good about planning, especially when we accomplish our goal, that's reinforced by our brain going, yeah, yes, here's some dopamine, uh, and it makes us feel good about doing it. 
All right. So that's one of them. Uh, another one. This one's more complicated, but it's uh, very, very, very important. It's a very, very old neurochemical, by the way. Um, this goes all the way back more than 300 million years ago, uh, and we share this with almost every single animal on the planet. Um, our receptors uh, and our circuitry in our brain for serotonin. So serotonin has several uh, roles, which I'll talk about here in a minute. Actually, I'm going to jack off the eye. <clears throat> Serotonin, you need a, uh, a, a correct balance of the more the better in most cases. Uh, but you want to uh, be able to have your body regulate your serotonin because this will keep you feeling more emotionally stable. What I mean by that is not extremely sad or not extremely happy when, when something good or bad happens. All right, uh, people with high levels of serotonin are generally uh, have a more stable mood, like I mentioned, so they're less prone to uh, mood disorders, getting depressed, uh, being anxious, uh, being overly excited for something, uh, like addicted to it, for example. <clears throat> People with high serotonin are, are more resistant to this. Uh, and this uh, has to do with mood regulation. And I'm oversimplifying, guys. These all have multiple roles, but I'm just giving you the, the gist of it to help you understand. Uh, a lot to do with mood regulation. <clears throat> so, example, um, people who are depressed sometimes, uh, one of the better ways they can try to deal with, cure, or treat their depression is to take um, medications that increase the amount of serotonin uh, in their brain, and that will help regulate their mood. <clears throat> uh, and it also has to do with your, I don't know how to phrase this exactly, but your sense of uh, self value, I guess you would say. And here's what I mean by that. If you feel like you are succeeding in life, and I don't mean like tricking yourself into succeeding, like sitting there going, I'm a great person, I'm good at what I do, I'm, I'm talking like your brain actually, uh, and this goes back millions of years, uh, we, we actually share this circuitry as far back as like crustaceans in the ocean, uh, lobsters have this. Um, your brain is constantly scanning your environment for uh, how other people are doing compared to you, all right? And the criteria can be arbitrary. It could be like how popular you are or how successful your business is or how much money you have or how strong you are, or how fast you are, how good at a sport you are, how smart you are, whatever it is, uh, whatever you value, you are constantly scanning yourself uh, compared to other members of society, all right? So let's say, uh, you, uh, let's say you really care about basketball, all right? You dedicate a lot of time to it. So you, consciously and unconsciously, are kind of scanning uh, your position amongst all other basketball players you know, all right? So if you are the best basketball player at your school, like you score the most points, you get the most play time, uh, it's clear that when you're on the court, your team is better than when you're not on the court. Um, that's somebody, and maybe in your league too, so all the people you're playing against, you are one of or the best person there. Uh, you're better than almost everyone you know at basketball. You are, if we looked at your brain, almost certainly, we would find that your levels of serotonin are, are high because you've, you've kind of noticed that you're doing really well. Like if there's a hierarchy of basketball players, like most people are uh, bad basketball players because they either never played it or they're not coordinated, they don't care, whatever. And then you've got a smaller amount of people that are uh, okay at basketball. Maybe they got a little natural talent. Maybe they played a little bit. Uh, then you've got the players that are uh, good, right? They've played it before. They Maybe they're taller or faster. They've played a lot before. They have a, a talent and a skill. And then at the top, you've got the uh, very good. And maybe the tippy-tippy top, you've got the elite, right? These are the ones that would go on to play college ball and NBA ball and things like that. So wherever you place yourself, uh, however you value yourself. And I don't mean like consciously, like I could be an NBA player, like thinking that constantly is not gonna work. But if you actually go out and uh, you reliably do well in basketball uh, compared to other people your age or your skill level, uh, your brain kind of checks where you are on this hierarchy, in this case of basketball. Uh, and the higher you are in this uh, um, hierarchy, the uh, generally speaking, the higher levels of serotonin you have. All right, so it's kind of like a self-check assessment for um, 
how much confidence you have in yourself. And I don't just mean like fake confidence, like telling yourself you're good. Like you actually do good. You go out there, you're like, I'm gonna do well. I'm gonna beat this guy or this team or have this game and, and you actually do. Uh, that is generally reflected in people's serotonin levels as well. What do you think though if um, is gonna happen? Let's say I was, uh, uh, I went to a small school, super small school, private school, like had like 50 students in the whole thing. All right, and there I was super good at basketball just because no one else was there was any good. Like there's only a few other students that even played it. They're shorter or slower or they don't care about basketball. So uh, just because I was a little tall and a little fast, I was better than all of them at basketball. If I went to that school and I checked their serotonin levels, where would I probably find uh, that person's serotonin at? And near the bottom or the top? Oh. Probably near the top, right? They probably have higher compared to the other ones that cared about basketball and weren't as good. All right, so that's great for that guy or girl, right? They think they're doing great. Their, uh, their uh, neurochemistry reflects that. They're feeling confident. But then we go and take this little team from this little private school with like nobody in it. And we go to uh, a tournament in the Bay Area or Southern California with massive schools, right? And they've got a bunch of fast players, tall players who have played their whole life all around the year, done competitive teams. Like they're destined for at least college, if not uh, a minor league or a major league um, uh, NBA position. How do you think that person's gonna do who's had no real competition and they're just kind of enjoying being in a pool of small players? They're gonna do badly, right. So what do you think's gonna happen to that individual who was very, who's a big fish in a small pond, but then he goes out to the ocean and sees there's a lot of much bigger fish out there. What do you think's gonna happen to their serotonin levels over time as they keep realizing that there are many other players better and taller and faster than them, uh, and they maybe never will catch up to them. Oh, it's gonna drop, exactly. So, uh, it, it's kind of a two-way thing here. It's, depending on how I see others, is gonna affect my serotonin levels. Uh, but at the same time, my serotonin levels are gonna make me more resistant to being um, upset about something or really excited about something. So it's kind of a two-way thing. But that's generally what you can expect if you're looking at serotonin levels. Uh, and they've actually tested this out in many other animals. Um, one of the more famous examples was uh, crustaceans, which we split off from evolutionarily, like well over a couple hundred million, like way before there were even trees like, that even existed. Uh, we branched off from these crustaceans like lobsters. Uh, and we share the exact same serotonin circuits uh, regarding status uh, that they do. So we found that um, if you go and look at lobsters, the males fight over territory underwater, all right? So I think you can assume if they're fighting, uh, a bigger male has an advantage, right? That's why they have weight, weight classes, by the way, in like the UFC and boxing, because that actually matters quite a bit if you're larger than your opponent. So uh, the big males, tend to do better, so they push other lobsters off of their territory, and yay them, they get access to more females in that area, all right? So what you find is uh, you've got several males with like a larger part of territory, and then maybe in on the edges or in between, you've got males that aren't as big and aren't as good as fighting, uh, have much smaller uh, territory uh, to control. All right, cool, so let's take, uh, let's compare. If I looked at the males that are bigger and have, win more fights and they have bigger territory, where do you think their serotonin levels are going to be on here? Uh, on the higher parts, right? And the, and the, the worse, I guess you would say, that the uh, male lobsters do in fighting or the smaller territory they have uh, is usually correlated also with their serotonin levels. They'll be lower. But you can actually make these ones that are close to depressed or see themselves as low status, you can actually make them think that they're high status. How do you think you can do that? How do you think I can do that? With medication. Uh, give what to them? Yeah, you give them, uh, we'll talk about what SSRIs are and how it works, but, but just to simplify for now, you give them medication that boosts their serotonin levels it actually technically makes you keep cycling the same ones over, but we'll get into that later. Um, that'll actually make them think they're up here. So uh, normally, when they lose a fight, they kind of get dejected and they go off and get off that male's territory, and, and they're uh, a little depressed until they can get their own territory or beat a male or whatever. But if I go take a male that lost and I give him a serotonin uh, 
an SSRI, one that increased their serotonin, all of a sudden, they'll go right back and fight that, that male immediately. They're much more likely to fight because they, they think that incorrectly, that they're uh, more dominant uh, or competent in their field. So even if they are an unsuccessful male, you give them the SSRI, it sort of tricks their brain chemistry into thinking, no, I am. So I'll go fight this big male over here because uh, I got no problem doing that, even though they're doomed to fail because they're like half the size of it. Uh, but it's an interesting um, uh, phenomenon. So anyways, that's what these do. So all of these, by the way, have multiple roles, but I'm just giving you kind of their, their primary roles. Because when we talk about serotonin in this class, we really only use it to talk about mood stabilizing uh, as far as like how it affects depression or, or bipolar disorder and all these other ones. You with me so far? A little bit? Okay. Other ones. Oh, endorphins. That's a big one. Anybody know what endorphins do? If I hurt myself, I fall, I have surgery, whatever, um, it hurts, obviously, and I'll have pain in that region over and over. So what do you do, generally, when uh, you're having this like chronic pain and you want to get rid of it, at least for a while? Endorphins make you feel less. Yeah, they, feel, they make you feel less pain. Yeah, okay, we'll, we'll get into that, but what do you do, generally, when you, uh, what? What kind of medicine? A painkiller, pain right. It could be a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug like uh, Tylenol or um, uh, aspirin, ibuprofen, uh, or you can get into the more uh, opioid stuff, which we'll talk about when we talk about a drug unit, but they basically do the same thing in different ways. Uh, they're mimicking endorphins because these are your natural painkillers, all right? Uh, and when you have a, a, a surge of them, like let's say you uh, got hurt or you take Advil or something like that, and it simulates <laughs> endorphins. Uh, it'll actually give you, um, if you have enough of it, a sort of, a, they call it a runner's high, but it is kind of like a, 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 almost like a drug high in that you'll feel a little euphoric, like things are just very positive and optimistic. Uh, you'll feel uh, warmer, uh, and then people also report feeling like, as if they're like lighter themselves, like almost like they're floating. Uh, that's like the extreme end if they took a lot of painkillers or they got a huge endorphin rush. Uh, but that's what painkillers do. Uh, and they do give you a little bit of euphoria if you get a lot of them. That's why, by the way, painkillers uh, will inevitably, if you keep using them or abuse them, they will become addictive because uh, you get used to that, uh, that high state and your body adjusts to that and it will require way more endorphins or, or uh, painkillers to, to not feel uh, down or bad or in pain. Uh, but we'll get into that when we get the drug in. But that's kind of what they do. So again, if I hurt myself and I'm getting a lot of pain, my brain will release endorphins to make that pain sort of uh, go away or reduce. And obviously your body can only do so much and that's why uh, if you're really in pain because of an injury or a surgery, uh, they can use medications to like give you synthetic endorphins that make that pain go away. All right, but it's not just magic when you take that pill. It's actually mimicking the painkillers you already have uh, and telling your, uh, uh, tricking your body into thinking they're endorphins and then uh, reducing that amount of pain that's coming from wherever the pain's coming from. But you can get addicted, which we'll talk about later. All right, uh, the other one, uh, norepinephrine and epinephrine. We'll just do norepinephrine for now. Uh, this has a lot to do with my arousal and alertness and focus. Uh, that's what I'll get a spike of, like if I have an adrenaline rush, and I get adrenaline, don't worry, it'll be in the notes. Uh, if I get an adrenaline rush, like I see something scary or I feel something scary uh, and I get a shot of adrenaline, I usually also get uh, norepinephrine and epinephrine, and those are what make me actually feel alert. So if I'm feeling tired um, or unfocused uh, or disinterested, I have probably got very low amounts of norepinephrine or epinephrine at that point. But if I see something that makes me interested or I become fearful or anxious, uh, or excited, uh, and I feel more focused, more alert, more awake, uh, that is almost certainly because my brain has released more uh, norepinephrine, more epinephrine. All right, those are the ones that kind of handle that. So like, it's not some mystical force that's pulling strings and making you focused or awake or happy or sad or, or whatever. It's your actual brain, and it's actually releasing or managing or mismanaging uh, these neurotransmitters. That's what actually makes you feel uh, certain ways. All right, so these feelings aren't, again, magical, mystical forces. It's just chemicals in your brain 
uh, that we don't totally understand yet, but we're, we're understanding more and more as we go. Are you with me so far on that? All right, cool. So let's talk about how it actually works then, and then we'll talk about the different systems. I'm going out of order that I have in the notes, but um, oh well. So here's how a neuron actually works. So a neuron is uh, a nerve cell. All right. And we're talking about here a brain cell specifically, but we're just going to say nerve cell for now. And they basically look like and function like this. So um, it's going to be kind of a long, skinny, almost squid-like looking uh, cell uh, that uses a combination of electricity and these chemicals uh, to communicate. So uh, most look like this. At the tail end, these are my receptors. These are where I get my information from. Uh, these, and I've got receptors at the end here that connect to other axons, which I'll get to in a second. These are what we call dendrites. All right, those are my receptors. Those are receiving signals from the uh, neurons it's connected to, the other nerve cells it's connected to. All right, so you uh, have billions, if not trillions. I know for sure you have billions. Maybe you have trillions, but uh, it's in the billions and trillions of how many you have in your body. They're so small, uh, and they're paired together in these uh, large lines and networks in your brain, uh, and these communicate to each other, and that's how your body actually uh, communicates. So dendrites receive it, and they travel through, and the actual root of the cell itself with the DNA and the mitochondria and the stuff that has the blueprint of what builds the cell, the cell body, uh, that's the soma, and that's up here, right? So that's the soma. And that's where I'll find the, the, the DNA, my blueprint, the mitochondria, I think it provides the energy, all that stuff uh, in my neuron, my nerve cell. You're not supposed to say it went to a 1040, they report that 256. Okay. So give them a 1040. Okay. That's what we're doing. So 10 till, remind me to pass these out if you guys can. So 55 minutes. 55 minutes. Yeah. Okay. Where was I? Oh, Soma. Yeah, that's the cell body. Okay, so that's where your DNA, mitochondria, all that stuff is, all the proteins that actually make the cell. Uh, that is where that is stored, all right? And uh, here's where we start getting more into the actual complicated, I'm gonna make this thinner actually, uh, terminology. Okay, so dendrites receive the signals from the cells. Uh, they'll actually receive the neurochemicals, by the way, and then they're gonna send an electrical signal down to the other end, the axon. All right, so this is going down and this is technically what's called the axon. And the axon, at the end, connects to other dendrites. So, this is the axon. Do I have a fourth part that I put in there? Is it just the myelin sheaths? Yeah. Or the synap synaptic gap that I have? Okay, that's actually at the end here. The synapse. Okay, so that's the basic structure of it, all right? Receiving, sending, all right? And the information, of course, does flow through here uh, to be sent. Everyone with me so far? All right, sweet. So uh, this is how they communicate. The axons here, uh, some people call this the synapse. This is where there's a tiny, tiny, tiny microscopic gap between the tip of this ax axon and the uh, next nerve cell, the next neuron's dendrites, right? So I would just basically take this exact thing I drew here and put another one that's touching it or almost touching it right next to it. So imagine another uh, set of dendrites at the other end here. Actually, I'll just put one up. Right, so there's the dendrites from the next neuron. This one won't be as pretty. And it goes to the next one, and so on and so forth. All right, so that's my next neuron, okay? And then, of course, there'd be one here, too, connected in different ways. So the way the message goes from this to this are these neurochemicals. All right, it actually, the axon releases these, and they travel over here, and they activate... Um, uh, receptor uh, uh, ports in the dendrite of the next neuron, and that's what sends the message to this axon, which sends the same message, which sends the same message, which sends the same message, all the way through uh, to whatever part of your body or part of your brain is being used. Uh, and that's exactly how it's going to work. So chemicals go between. So what's going to tell my dendrites what was received and tell my axons what to release? So I've got the neurochemical is the go-between, all right? It's what carries the message from one neuron to the next. But what carries it from the dendrites to the uh, uh, axons, do you think? So I've got neurochemicals. What other part have I not explained yet? 
<coughs> Those are the neurotransmitters. Yeah, the, electri the electric part is the part that I haven't communicated. With. <coughs> All right, so the electricity portion is kind of like the, uh, the go-between, specifically here on the axon, this portion right here. All right, so what I'm gonna do uh, for as far as drawing, I'm going to uh, zoom in on that little pathway. All right, so the part I'm gonna draw up here is just gonna be like this, blown up, big size. All right, so you with me? All right, so these neurotransmitters, these are the chemicals, dopamine, serotonin, endorphins, norepinephrine, there's other ones too, but we're just gonna look at these four for now. Uh, the axon releases them, they're received by the dendrites, and then they're like, okay, that was, say it was dopamine. Releases dopamine, it hops over here to the dendrite, activates the dopamine uh, receptor, and it says, oh, that was dopamine, so it sends the signal down here uh, to the next axon, which carries that same message on uh, throughout all of your neurons. Okay, so if I zoom in here, here's how this works. I'm not even sure why they want us to know this, but they do, and again, they've asked a couple questions about it before, so I gotta tell you. So, if I zoom in on this axon portion of this pathway, uh, here's what it'll look like, or, or roughly speaking. So, if I zoom in, uh, I have um, a membrane here, which is kind of like a wall but things can go in and out of it if they fit the right shape. So it's just like the hormone um, receptors, they only fit certain uh, pieces, right? So like, it's just like when you're a little kid and you got those little uh, uh, kind of like puzzle things that have like a shape like a star. You can't shove the square into the star, it won't fit. The only thing that fits is the um, star. It's very much like these, these membranes. So these membranes have these little gateways but again, they only fit certain uh, molecules in them, right? Just like those little uh, jigsaw things for uh, little kids. You can't shove the star into the square and vice versa. It only accepts certain things. <clears throat> okay, so if I look in here, I have, I think it's the sodium in outside, the potassium inside. I actually forget which is which. <clears throat> Do I have any notes which one's outside? Sodium's outside. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> so we've got the uh, sodium molecules out here. and I have potassium molecules in here. And these are ions. Do you guys know what ions are? Okay, it's, uh, it's from chemistry. It's a, uh, it's a term meaning they either have a negative or a positive charge, meaning they have an, either an extra uh, electron or they have, uh, they're lacking an electron, all right? In this case, they're gonna be negative. So they have an extra, um, electron, because that's a negative charge. So all these little ions are uh, a negative charge. So they're all negative. OK. <clears throat> so what makes the, uh, well, why do we care about the electrical charge? Uh, if you have two negatives, it's like a magnet. Do they do anything? No, they just repel. You, you can't even stick them together. What, what causes a magnet to go and stick together? Positive. Yeah, you got to have a positive, right? Because those electrons, this extra electron is looking for a, uh, an atom or a, or, a, or a particle that's got an, an opening for a, an electron and they'll hop over to it, all right? Because that's why you can't take a magnet and stick both ends together. Because if you put two negative charges together, they don't go together, they actually push away. Or take two positive uh, ends, they'll, they'll push away. But if I take a positive and a negative, they'll share electrons and that's what sucks them together, all right? So uh, I got a bunch of negatives. So what makes uh, this different is inside I have a bunch of tiny little molecules called proteins, all right? And I don't mean protein like, I need a protein shake. I mean proteins like these tiny, tiny, tiny little molecules inside your cells uh, that, uh, I told you about these yesterday, they, ha they have like these functions. We don't really know, at least I haven't heard anyway, how they work, because they actually like go in your cell and they like have a job. They like go, I gotta move this thing. They'll get energy from your cell, uh, ATP, and they'll, they'll like move things or turn things on and off, and we don't know what makes those things go and how they know what to do, what they do. Uh, there's proteins inside here. And those proteins have a positive charge. All right, with me? Okay. So here's how um, I get electricity to move down my axon and send a signal. Um, if I've got these closed off, which I do right now, they're closed, uh, what is the charge that's on the outside? It's gonna be negative. All the things are negative, right? It's just negative, negative. So what's it waiting for? 
It's waiting for positive, right? It's always waiting to combine with anything that's positive, okay? So when I separate all the sodium on the outside um, and I leave the potassium inside and these proteins, uh, there's actually, for whatever reason, the, the numbers, the way they match up, uh, the proteins make it so that there's actually more of a positive charge on the inside. So what would happen if I opened up these gates here? Would everything stay the same? No. What would happen? What? Uh, yes, uh, or, the, or the proteins and potassium perhaps, depending on which is where, uh, would go out. So they're actually gonna uh, uh, switch places. This is called, with water anyway, it's called osmosis. The, the universe always evens itself out. So if like I'm holding a, if I take a cup of water and I put a divider in it and I pour all the water into this side, what's gonna happen when I uh, poke a hole in this little divider? Yeah, it's going to, so I poke a bunch of little holes in here, uh, it's going to pour into the other side, obviously. It's trying to reach equilibrium. Uh, it does that even with like sponges. Like the water, for whatever reason, is always trying to even itself out. That's why you can put uh, a tissue in a cup of water. And what, what happens to the tissue? Does it just get wet, the part that touches the water? No, what happens? Yeah, the water actually climbs uh, inside the tissue because it's always trying to even itself out. That's called osmosis. So magnets, the magnets in the same way, electrical charge. So if I open this up, if I open the barrier, uh, it's going to try to even its own charge out. All right, so when I receive a signal from a dendrite, or from an exon rather, and it tells my dendrite, oh, that was dopamine, um, it's going to open up uh, these gates. So you've got energy inside, I'm not gonna get too into it, it's called ATP, uh, doesn't triphosphate, uh, and that's what activates and gives you energy for your cells to do this. That's why, by the way, if you don't get water, you don't have any ATP, so none of your cells can do anything. So you die very quickly uh, if you have zero water. That's what actually, and the oxygen. So you have to breathe and take in oxygen and calories uh, for your cells to do anything. It puts a bunch of ATP in your cells and that allows your cells to move. If you don't have water or you don't breathe and have oxygen or you don't have enough food, you can't do that, your cells die. That's what kills you if you're strangled or don't get enough water or don't get enough food. All right, but we're not gonna get into that. Just know that's what happens. So uh, these open up, and then you guys already told me what's going to happen. It's just going to go down. Yeah, they're going to spread out, right? So uh, my uh, K's and NA's and uh, P's are all going to scramble until the point that uh, some have uh, actually switched sides, all right, to change the uh, charge. All right, so yay. Now I have an even charge across the board. All right, so I've sent one rushing signal. Everything went whoop and went to their uh, uh, different areas, uh, and that's what that electrical signal is going to be as it moves through, all right? But that would only be one single single signal. That would be it. It should be like one. That's all it would be, all right? And I can't communicate with just one signal. It's one single signal, that's a tongue twister. Uh, I'm gonna need to be able to do this again if these things, because like your neurons don't just communicate one time ever. They're like, what's my one job? Here it is, uh, and then they die. They have to be able to do that over and over again. So what you have are these uh, little mechanisms called sodium potassium pumps on your cell membranes. And what they do is they grab the floating uh, uh, Ks and NAs that have switched places and the proteins, and they uh, grab them and throw them back out uh, inside and inside. So very quickly, the uh, potassium gets sucked back in through these little pumps that only grab that specific size molecule, right? It's just like the little kid puzzle. It can only grab the potassium molecule, throws it on through, and uh, the uh, sodium is pumped out, all right? And the proteins uh, also move. So what's that gonna reset? What's gonna happen again when all these things go back to where they were? The inside will be positive, right? I get rid of all my NAs. My proteins have moved as well. So it's back to just potassium and just uh, the positive proteins. And on the outside, all the uh, uh, potassium has been moved back in. Uh, any proteins that were have been moved back in too. So what charge am I left with on the outside? Negative. Negative, okay, cool. This is like a loaded gun, essentially. All right, it's ready to fire. That is what we call uh, action potential. It's like when you pull back a rubber band. That's potential energy. Because my, I don't have a rubber band, I don't think. Oh, I do. Let me get it. Sorry if I shoot it at you. All right. 
So this rubber band, uh, if I just let go of it, is it going to do anything except just fall? Mm -hmm. No, it's just going to fall, right? But what if I do this? What happens if I let go of it now? It's going to shoot, right? So I basically, I know that the electrical charge thing doesn't quite work, but this is like a, a loaded rubber band or loaded gun. It's ready to, to fire, essentially, right? And as soon as I get the signal, it's released, and boom, I release the energy. And in this case, the molecule spot places, right? That's what it's waiting for. Uh, and then the sodium potassium pumps switch everything back to make it uh, loaded again. So when these things are closed and they've been separated, it's waiting for a signal, it's ready to go. But if I open them, like when I get a signal, and they all uh, switch places and they have even charges, that's just like a rubber band that's, that's set to do nothing. It's got no potential there, all right? So action potential is when that axon is ready to fire uh, its electrical signals because all of the uh, sodium and potassium have been switched and there's a negative charge on the outside and a positive charge on the inside, all right? And that mechanism happens very, very, very quickly, like instantaneously as far as we can tell. It's just going like, like insanely fast on a very small scale, all right? So that's how I send one signal, but how the hell is my uh, uh, axon supposed to know which of these was received? Like, are there letters there? How could I, com how could I communicate with just a signal? Is there a language we know about where you communicate with just single signals? Yes, it's the frequency. It's just like Morse code. Anybody know what Morse code is? Yeah. Oh, good. A good chunk of you do. A couple of you don't. Um, that's basically where I can't see anything, right? And I only have one thing I can hear. It's just one single sound, like a, a tap or a, you know, we've probably heard it on like uh, shows and things like It's like a do 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 That's all they can hear. It's like, how do you know what they're trying to say? You know what they're trying to say based on how many times or how long they hold that do 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 sound. All right, so it's like Morse code. So your uh, axon communicates which one of these was received by sending a different frequency. So I'm gonna make it up. Let's pretend that uh, dopamine, when it's received, it's like, okay, that was dopamine. The signal it sends is like three quick taps. So three taps is dopamine. Uh, four taps is serotonin. Uh, two fast taps and two slow taps are endorphins. And then uh, one fast tap and three slow taps are norepinephrine, all right? So that's how my uh, um, axons would know which one to release. So they'd be sitting there always listening, obviously, and uh, waiting for these electrical pulses to come through. And if I get three taps, it knows, oh, that's, uh, that's dopamine. And it releases dopamine to the next dendrite and it, the signal keeps on going. Uh, if it heard two fast taps, and then two slow taps, it would know, oh, that was uh, endorphins, released endorphins, and the signal keeps going on. All right, that's how they communicate. So it's the frequency of those little electrical signals. All right, I know that's super mechanical and engineering focused and, well, it's probably one of the more boring things we talk about, but that's how it actually works. All right, <clears throat> so are we clear so far on how the message goes uh, across the neuron? Do we have that down? Okay. All right, nervous system. So uh, I'm not talking about the whole system yet. We're still talking about the actual nerves themselves and how they communicate. Um, oh, we can try to refresh the memory on it. Uh, here's how one roughly looks. Um, what would my, what would these be called? Hands, 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 so I can give you more go Dendrites? Yeah, dendrites. I should have made a joke about being dendrite, but oh well. Um, over here where the uh, electrical signal sent. Ax what? Um, ax axon. Axon, okay. Sorry. It's all right. Axon. Uh, what about that? Soma. Soma. Nice. It's your body. Okay. And before I lose track. I actually didn't get a chance to talk about it yet, but uh, what's this area called with the with the gap and axon term? Uh, okay, you can call it that, but the, the term we're looking for 
I'll accept that. But I, there's another term for it, where this, this gap where they communicate between. Uh, synapses? Yeah. Synaptic gap or synapses when they're going between. Synaptic. Or synapses, yeah. <clears throat> I'll give you both for that. Okay. Um, when I zoom in on the, uh, where's your name? There it is. When I zoom in on the uh, axon here, and I blow it up, and I got my membranes, I've got ions in, out, and uh, proteins. Can anybody tell me which one's which as far as where they go and what the charges are? I'll give you two for that. Um, oh, you can't look, sorry. Inside is uh, potassium, and it's negative, and outside is sodium that's positive. Okay, close except for the charge on the outside. So you've got, uh, you do have the sodium, so I'll give you for that. On the outside, and the potassium on the inside. Um, but what are the charges, and also what's missing on the inside? Um, the potassium and the sodium, they both negative. Yep. There's protein on the inside of the body. Nice, gives a, a net charge here of what? What? No, if they're separated. Positive. Positive. Nice, and then negatives on the outside. Cool. When it's loaded like that, like a gun, ready to ready to go and uh, send a signal, electrical impulse. Um, what do we uh, What do we call that? Action potential. Nice. Action potential. All right. So when I receive a uh, chemical signal from the uh, previous axon or the previous neuron. Um, what are those chemicals called? I don't need the name of the four of them that I told you about. I just need like the term that describes all of these uh, chemicals. What are they called? You again? Yeah. Neurotransmitters. Neurotransmitters, right? Right. So we talked about dopamine, endorphins, and uh, what else? Serotonin and norepinephrine. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. So those neurotransmitters. The neurotransmitter arrives. Let's say it's dopamine, and it's like boom. It activates dopamine receptor, uh, so it knows how many, uh, what pattern of electrical signal to send to communicate. It goes down, right? So these membranes open up. They all swap places. I'm not going to swap individuals, but you know they swap places in sodium potassium uh, to get a net charge of neutral, nothing. All right? How does it reset? So now it's no longer potential. Uh, how does it reset these uh, ions to uh, change the charges to go back to being ready for another charge? Uh, I think it's sodium potassium. There you go. These sodium potassium pumps, nice, are the ones that uh, rearrange them to bring the charge back. Uses energy to do that. Cool. That's AT, but we don't need to know that. Um, what we do need to know, though, is just basically so you have an understanding. This is the same with hormones, too. Uh, how do these pumps work? How do they only grab certain ions, or in the case of hormones, uh, or neurotransmitters? How are they only activated by certain hormones or certain neurotransmitters? Um, frequencies. Oh, that's how they know which one to send. But I'm talking about activating these things. Like it grabs either sodium ions or potassium ions or neurotransmitters. They only accept certain neurotransmitters. Or for hormones, they're only activated by certain hormones and not others. Why? How? What determines that? Because they have a specific shape. Yep, they have a specific uh, signal and shape, right? So they would only fit in, in one. Right, so if I have an estrogen receptor and then a uh, growth hormone rolls by, it's not gonna activate it, right? Because it doesn't fit in. It's just like the little kid puzzles I talk about with the shapes, like it's a star, but you can only fit the star and if you have a square, it's not gonna fit in there. Uh, it's just like, well, it's similar to that. All right, so that's how it works. Yeah, sodium potassium pumps, cool. We got a refresher there. Well, who gave me the sodium potassium pump answer? Somebody did. Oh, I already gave you for that one. Oh, and then nobody gave me it. Who said it fit? Somebody said that. Was it James? I think it was. Okay, cool. All right. So that's kind of a refresher of what we talked about. Uh, now let's talk about this region, the synapse, the synaptic gap. All right. So I'm going to zoom in again to uh, look at the uh, end here. So when the communication is going from one axon to the dendrites of the next one, that's what we're zooming in on. There's a tiny little gap. It's called the synaptic gap. Uh, so here's the uh, end of my uh, axon at the synapse. This is dying on. I did, yes. Wow. Throwing away a lot of markers, so. Got a lot of practice. Okay, cool. 
there's a little gap, and then here's the uh, dendrite uh, for the other side. So, just like with the hormones or the sodium potassium pump, there's receptors on the dendrite, and they only accept certain shapes or chemical signals, right? So we're gonna use shapes just to make it uh, simple for us. So we'll pretend there's, uh, there's gonna be more than 40, or sorry, four, but we're just gonna use four. So one's a triangle, all right? That'll be uh, dopamine. Uh, square is gonna be serotonin. And uh, a circle is endorphin. Oh, we only need three, that's fine, all right? Those are my neurotransmitters. Again, I got more than three, but that's just what we're saying for, for right now. All right, so what do you think the shape of my dopamine receptors will be, the ones that are activated by dopamine? There we triangles, right, yeah. So uh, on my dendrite, I have a bunch of receptors uh, that can um, be activated by the release of dopamine or endorphins or uh, serotonin, all right? So uh, like, oh, well, here's one for a square, here's one for a triangle, here's one for a circle. We'll just keep that pattern going. Good enough. All right. So it looks like that. Obviously, it's 3D, not 2D. So there's a bunch over here, and there's a bunch of different ones. But just understand that's the basic scheme. Uh, certain receptors over here only accept uh, the correct chemical signal, in this case, a shape. All right. So let's say uh, I hurt myself on accident playing something. Uh, if I get hurt, What's my body uh, do to try to alleviate that pain? What's it release? What Endorphins. neurotransmitter? Endorphins. Endorphins, right. These are my painkillers. Um, and a lot of, of course, makes you feel euphoric and floaty and warm and all that stuff, which is why people get high in opiates uh, and other things. But uh, endorphins, so here's what happened. My brain goes to release it, so the neurons in my brain uh, will send the signal to uh, release endorphins, right? That's how I'll feel uh, the way I feel when I'm not feeling painful or I'm feeling euphoric or whatever. Uh, so I get the signal, it comes down. <clears throat> uh, I get the electrical signal, kind of like a Morse code, tells the axon which one to release. Uh, and they're stored here in the end, all right? So we'll just call these vacuoles or uh, the sacs with them uh, in the, uh, the, the end of the axon here. So um, let's say my endorphins are kept here and dopamine's here and serotonin's there. All right, so it's got a bunch of uh, endorphin neurotransmitters in here. Dopamine here, serotonin here. Uh, I get the signal, or not I, but my neuron gets the signal to release endorphins. I don't know, say it's like one, two, three, one, two, three. It's like, oh, okay. So what it does is it basically opens this up and releases uh, some endorphins, all right? Uh, and they're going to travel across here in this space, okay? So I get a bunch of endorphins. In this case, they're gonna be circles. So here's a whole bunch of circles that go floating out. Hooray! There they go. All right, so they're between the gap and they're gonna float around in here, all right? Some of them are gonna float around and bump into a serotonin uh, receptor. What's gonna happen? It's not Nothing, it's not gonna hold, it's not gonna activate it, right? It might go in there, but it's not gonna send the signal that says, yes, serotonin. Nothing's gonna happen, just nothing. All right, same thing if it goes to a dopamine receptor, right? It's gonna get in there, but it's not gonna activate it, no signal gets sent, all right? But when it gets to an endocrine, uh, or sorry, an endorphin uh, receptor, it's going to fit in the slot, or you don't have the right chemical signature, uh, and that's gonna activate the receptor here. Bing. And then it sends the signal right on down uh, to the axon, to the next uh, <laughs> neuron, uh, and so, so on and so forth. All right, that's how it works. Okay, that's how those signals go across. And there's a bunch of dopamine, or sorry, a bunch of endorphins. They'll find the receptors. Uh, these don't activate, because that's the wrong one. And the signal uh, goes on. That's how I relieve my pain, in this case, all right? What's dopamine do? Well, what's one of the things it does when it's released in my brain? Makes you happy. Yeah, it's like my reward uh, uh, neurotransmitter, right? So, let's say something really cool happened to me, and I experience happiness or positive emotion, whatever, uh, my brain would uh, activate my neurons to release uh, dopamine. Uh, in this case, of course, they're gonna be triangles in our little example. Uh, and they float over and again, anytime they go to a terminal for uh, uh, serotonin, they might go in there, but they won't activate it, right? So nothing, goes to an endorphin one, doesn't activate, goes to a dopamine one, 
it does activate, right? And it activates it, the signal goes down uh, to the next one. So it's the same process. <clears throat> so do you understand that? How, you, how your neurons send the uh, signal, like between one another. They release what? What are those called, these, these chemicals? Neurotransmitters. Neurotransmitters, right. And those float across the synaptic gap and they activate uh, receptors, all right? Only the ones that they chemically align with, that they, that they fit into, all right? Um, genes actually have a big impact <clears throat> on how much these things affect you. So, uh, if I'm somebody who has a, uh, how can I phrase this? People that are uh, more prone to addiction for, uh, you know, what, like uh, something that's excitatory. Um, maybe like cocaine, because cocaine basically help, enhances your dopamine receptors. Um, do you think I'm more or less likely to be addicted to a substance that, that mimics dopamine if I have more or less receptors for dopamine? So hold on, before you, before you answer that, let me give you an example here. So let's say person uh, A, has got, um, you have way more receptors than this. I don't want to like oversimplify, but uh, I want to keep the numbers low just so we can kind of um, understand it. So you have way more receptors than the numbers I'm going to give you, but here's an example. Let's say person uh, A has uh, dopamine receptors and they've only got uh, five. All right. Uh, person B, they've got uh, seven. I'm not actually counting, I'm just going to put it up here. Seven, and then this person over here has got 13. Sorry, person C has got 13 dopamine receptors. All right, and your genes uh, pick how your uh, brain is structured, your neurons, as far as like how many dopamine receptors you have, how many serotonin receptors you have, how many neurons you have in your brain, and, and sort of uh, where they uh, they're connected better and more. Uh, but one of the things that definitely affects is how many receptors you have. All right, so which person do you think is more likely to be addicted to uh, uh, dopamine type activities? All right, so things that make you uh, feel good, so, someone that feels like they need it uh, more often. A. Okay, who, well, let's do a vote. Oh. Yeah, let's do a vote, I'd rather do this. Have we done a vote in here before? Mm -hmm. yes. We have, okay, so we'll do it the same way. I want you to influence each other, so please uh, put your heads down and cover it. So who do you think would be more likely to uh, be addicted to dopamine type substances. Uh, so we got person A with five receptors, person B with seven, and person C with 13 receptors. Who thinks that person A is more likely to be addicted to dopamine type uh, rushes or substances, experiences, whatever one is? All right, so we got, here we go. Uh, who thinks that person B is the most likely to be, um, or most susceptible to addiction uh, by? Dopamine. All right, cool. And again, you can get dopamine from anything. You get it from eating your favorite food or doing something you like or watching a funny video or whatever. Those are all dopamine. All right. Uh, who thinks person C is the most likely to be uh, addicted to it? All right, that wins by a large margin. Okay. So 20 plus of you said C, eight of you said A, and only two of you said B. All right. <clears throat> Uh, you guys are correct on this one. It is person C. Why do you think, somebody give me an explanation for why they think person C is the most likely to be addicted to um, reward-based uh, stimuli. And again, that could be eating the foods you like, watching funny videos, doing things that are fun, or whatever it is, or drugs that uh, simulate dopamine. Because they already have a lot, so they don't want more. What do you mean? Okay, so do you think that more receptors even equal you feeling it more intensely? That would be more or less correct. All right, there's more complications to it, but yeah, uh, if you have more receptors for it, uh, it it's going to likely feel uh, better or worse in this case. Uh, so people that have a lot of these dopamine receptors uh, are generally a little more prone uh, to addiction from dopamine uh, or sub substances that mimic dopamine, which we'll get into in a second. All right, so that does have a major impact on uh, your behavior. And what determines how many receptors I have in my neurons? Genetics. 
genetic. Yeah, it's largely genetic, right? Because uh, you're getting the same uh, codings from your parents, uh, and then you're likely to inherit the same amount of receptors as uh, one of them. Uh, or I'm not sure how the genes work with, with receptors. It might be like some sort of mix between the two. Most, a lot of genes are like, you either activate the one from your dad or activate the one from your mom. Sometimes they uh, co-mix as far as their expression. But yeah, uh, you were largely, uh, this is largely gen genetically determined as far as how many receptors you have. So how sensitive you are to this stuff. All right. <clears throat> All right. So glad you understand that. Okay. So that's largely genetic as far as how many receptors you have. That's of course going to affect your behavior because if I got way more dopamine receptors, I'm more likely to be addicted to dopamine type activities uh, than someone who's not. Okay, glad you understand that. All right, well, let's go back to what we're talking about. So, uh, our example was endorphins, right? Or no, we were doing dopamine now. So, boom, dopamine's released. So the person over here, so this is a triangle. So this guy, let's say this guy's got a ton of uh, dopamine receptors. All right, so dopamine's released. They go around, doo -doo -doo. they pull it around in here, uh, they come up here, they activate it, send a signal, all right? So what, do they just stay there forever and keep activating and you keep feeling happy all the time? No, they don't always stay there. They're, they're going to go back. All right, actually, two things are gonna happen. Some of them are absorbed back up into uh, the axon, right? And they're just repackaged for uh, another time. Some because uh, these, are, these are molecules and chemicals, some of them uh, just break down out here and essentially disappear and your, your body gets rid of them as waste. All right. <clears throat> that process of some, of course, breaking down and, and disappearing and others being taken back into the previous axon for release later, that process is called reuptake. All right. So releasing them and having them activate the receptors that's the communication, all right? And then your body, uh, or your neurons, uh, are going to reabsorb some of them uh, for later use, and then some will uh, break down over time. That's what reuptake is, all right? So, <clears throat> let's say there's a person who's got a, a we'll, we'll talk a lot more about depression later, there's a lot of factors that, that factor in, but for sake of keeping it simple, Let's say this person uh, has a life that is relatively good. They've got a stable relationship, good family, good job. Everything's going well for them, but they're experiencing uh, depression. So they're like feeling lethargic or hopeless or uninterested. Uh, and they look in their life and there's nothing to explain. It's not like they had a relative die or the relationship's bad or their job's bad or they just got a divorce. Nothing like that. Nothing that would suggest something's causing them to feel um, uh, depressed just based on their life. Uh, what maybe could help that person out if their life is in order and yet they're experiencing uh, depression? Do you guys remember? I think I told you this. Maybe I didn't tell you this actually. Uh, which neurotransmitter? Yeah, serotonin. <clears throat> that can help out uh, people who are experiencing depression. If you're, if you're depressed because of uh, some issue in your life, like you know something's going on that's causing it, uh, the medication may not help uh, as much as it would somebody who has a, a life that's stable and fulfilling and they're experiencing, in that case, it might just be their uh, brain chemistry. All right, so that's, I want to tell you that before we talk about depression is it's complicated. Just because you feel depressed doesn't mean I go to the therapist and get happy pills. That's not how it works. Uh, if your problem isn't purely physiological, having to do with your neurons, then the medication might not work at all or it might only help. There might be other factors. We'll get to that later though. For now, let's talk about a person who the only problem they have is there's a, a, a malfunctioning in their neurons. All right, so their life's fine, but they're not getting enough serotonin. All right, so their body like doesn't have enough or they don't release enough or whatever. So when I would normally have serotonin releases uh, that keep me emotionally stable and all of that, which is going on you know, off and on throughout the day. Let's say normal, normal people have like uh, a bunch of this out there. This person though, for whatever reason, uh, they have very low serotonin. There's only a couple that go in and out, right? And, and we found that if all of the factors are okay and you have low serotonin levels, that can be uh, the cause and then they can fix it with medication uh, uh, sometimes, most of the time in that case, all right? So <clears throat> my problem then uh, is what for this person is experiencing it? What are, what, are they, what are they lacking? How could we 
Well, you know what they're lacking, they're lacking serotonin. How can we help them out with medication? Give them more serotonin. Okay. It's not like we can just package serotonin and have you just drink it, though. So uh, it's a little more complicated than that. And there's different forms of these, but that's essentially what you're doing. You're trying to give them more serotonin, all right? So it's not like you just inject them with it. Uh, but there are a, uh, and there's multiple types of antidepressants. Some of them have to do with dopamine, too. But uh, let's we'll stick with the serotonin ones. Uh, some of these are called SSRIs. <clears throat> and basically all they are are serotonin uh, reuptake inhibitors. All right, this is where the words start getting tricky. So reuptake, what's reuptake mean? Stuff when it's destroyed or it goes back. Okay, cool. Specifically when it goes back, yeah. Uh, so it's reabsorbed. All right, what's inhibit mean? To stop it. So what do you think an, a reuptake inhibitor does? It makes it go back and not come back. What? It stops it from going back. It stops it from going back, from being reuptaken, I guess you would say, okay? So these don't, don't necessarily give them more serotonin. It just keeps the serotonin active longer, all right? So instead of the serotonin going, huh, activate one or two, and then going right back, and that person not getting enough uh, um, um, stimula stimulation uh, from serotonin, mm -hmm. it blocks the reuptake, all right? I'm not exactly sure how the actual chemical works. I don't know if it me makes like a, uh, the receptors that take it back, blocks them, or it causes these uh, sacs that hold them to not activate. I'm not sure what exactly what it does, but I do know that it prevents the serotonin from being uh, reuptaken, all right? So that means the serotonin particles or molecules keep floating around. And if they keep floating around in here, what are they gonna do inevitably? What? Dissolve. Okay, they will eventually. But until they dissolve, what are they going to be doing in there? Are they just gonna sit there and not do anything? Yeah, they're gonna go back and keep activating uh, these uh, serotonin receptors. So, if I'm a person that uh, their issue is they're lacking serotonin and they're caught to feel depressed, if I give them an SSRI, a serotonin reuptake inhibitor, and I stop the serotonin from going back up into the axon and I keep it in that gap and it keeps activating more and more serotonin receptors, it's almost like having more serotonin because uh, I'm getting more stimulation from it throughout the day, all right? Uh, and that's essentially how they work, okay? <clears throat> um, and that's, uh, that's the process of reuptake. So that, what, that's what I want to get uh, across to you. I don't know, I don't remember if it's in the notes or not, but I, are SSRIs or, or serotonin reuptake inhibitors in there at all? Some of you say yes, some of you say no. Uh, enough of you said yes for me to think that there is. Uh, so that's how they work. All right, so that's how this one particular branch of uh, anti-depression, uh, antidepressants work. They block the reuptake of serotonin. So your body releases it, or not your body, your neurons uh, release it, they activate serotonin, uh, and instead of going back up and stopping and you not getting any more serotonin uh, stimulation, uh, they're blocked and they stay there and they keep over time activating uh, those receptors. All right, and that's almost the same thing as you having more serotonin which in this case could help you out with your depression. You follow me on that? Nice, okay. Now you're going to tell me, how does my neuron communicate with the next neuron? You don't need to do the whole process, just like give me one step of it. So the axon gets the electrical signal, and where are we at when it gets to the, uh, that area between the neurons? But first, let's, start, let's start first with this. What's the name for the area between those uh, neurons? No. No, 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 go enhance. Synaptic. Yeah, synaptic gap. Where's my little pen? There it is. Synaptic gap. Sweet, cool, got that. Synaptic. Yeah. All right. So if I hear the term synapse, what do I think we're talking about? The process. Yeah, exactly. That process of communicating. Okay. Speaking of which, uh, I'll stick with you just because I can't quite give that uh, point, but maybe I could for this one. How does it communicate with the next one? Just, just communicating from here to here. So it releases neurotransmitters. 
There we go. At least neurotransmitters. Sweet. All those neurotransmitters uh, get flung out from the axon. They cross that synaptic gap uh, and they activate receptors there. Cool. I'll give you that. Excellent. And that, that's called a synapse, right? The communications between the two. All right. So I released a bunch. They're activating the receptors. Uh, tell me about these receptors as far as like uh, how they work or uh, what determines how many I have, anything along those lines. So it's genetically determined how many you have. Mm -hmm. They're like not necessarily shaped in a certain way, but right. they only interact with like the neurotransmitter that it's like assigned. Exactly, right. And we use shapes to make it simple for our brains to understand. But yeah, uh, they're only going to accept a certain a matching neurotransmitter. If a, if a dopamine comes up to a serotonin one, it's not going to activate it. Uh, all right, cool. So that's how it communicates. Sweet, you're racking up some serious Morgan bucks. Um, then what? After they've activated, what happens next? So you've activated a few, they float it around, and then what's going to happen? They send a signal to the next neuron. Okay, they do, but I'm talking about they've already done that. So activated it. They've already done their activations. Now what? They either dissolve or they get uh, reuptake happens. Yeah, exactly. What, what is reuptake? They go back to where they were. Yeah, they go back to the original uh, neuron and they're, they're stored again. So some do dissolve, but some uh, are taken back, and that, of course, is called reuptake. Well done. And what else do I want to say about this? Oh, um, what are a couple ways? Well, what's, what's one way I could, if somebody's lacking a uh, neurotransmitter, whether it's dopamine or it's serotonin or whatever. What's one way, if I told you, uh, that you can allow that person to experience more of that neurotransmitter? All right, I don't know who was first in that one. I think it was you by a hair. Um, you could give them a re reuptake inhibitor and like it can't go back, so it just has to stay there and activate. It, cool, exactly right. So it prevents the uh, uh, reuptake process, a reuptake inhibitor. Uh, and those can't go back in, so they eventually float back and keep reactivating uh, those receptors. Excellent. Okay, cool. So we got that. You're with me on that one? Sweet. Next, I want to discuss uh, drugs. Yay. Besides, drugs are bad, okay? All right. So uh, what drugs are, essentially, is uh, they either provide you with a lot of neurotransmitters or they uh, mimic them. They uh, fit the, the receptor slot, essentially, all right? Cocaine. Yeah, cocaine's one of them, right? You, you could, any, uh, the drugs do different things. Some of them uh, mimic, some of them cause you to release your own. Uh, some of them activate different neurotransmitters, but uh, yeah, let's use uh, cocaine as an example, okay? So uh, somebody who uses cocaine, um, what they're experiencing is, uh, well, well, several of these, I believe it's epinephrine, norepinephrine, and dopamine, but they're not getting necessarily more of those uh, for themselves. The chemicals in the cocaine, along with them, uh, are activating the receptors, all right? So let's say I have a molecule of whatever in the cocaine, all right, that's the C here. All right, um, if my body, uh, dopamine, we'll just focus on the dopamine, right? That's my positive happiness. Like there's other ones too, along with cocaine, but we'll just focus on that. So I got my dopamine that normally makes me feel happy, right? So whatever amount I normally have, let's just say in this case it's two. Obviously I have way more than that, but let's say it's two. Uh, cocaine's like a big flood of those, like all at once uh, in, a, in a very short amount of time. And what those do is, what would, what would normally only be activated by dopamine, uh, these molecules from the cocaine actually do activate the dopamine receptor as well, even though there's no dopamine there, all right? So these, uh, they mimic it, they fit the same slot, all right? And that is called an agonist. Uh, they are going to, of course, uh, mimic a neurotransmitter, all right? So it's not dopamine itself, although I'm gonna get a release of dopamine too, but it's not dopamine itself, but in this case, this drug can mimic dopamine. So when it goes to the receptor, it activates it as if dopamine was there, all right? Uh, and this is a super rush of it. And you can't reuptake this. So it's just gonna stay there until it dissolves or run its course. So for like, you know, I don't know exactly how long the effects of cocaine last, but I know it's shorter than most drugs. So let's just say it's two hours. For like two hours, um, especially when you first take it, you're gonna feel really good, 
all right? Because they can't be reuptaken. They keep activating the dopamine receptors like crazy. You feel amazing. You feel super alert, all that stuff. Uh, they slowly dissolve over time. So as those two hours go on, you feel a little, little less, a little less, a little less, a little less uh, until it's gone, all right? Uh, and that's, that's essentially what, what drugs do. So some of them stay in there for much longer. Some of them provide you with more of your own neurotransmitters. Um, some of them uh, are going to mimic it, but uh, that's sort of how they work. They're going to, uh, again, cause you to release more of your own, or they're going to mimic and activate them uh, themselves. And that's why you get that sensation. That's why they're so addictive. That's why people uh, like using them, obviously, uh, is because whatever it is that you want, uh, in this case, it's gonna be you know alertness, energy, happiness uh, for cocaine, that's what they're, they're going for. All right, uh, same thing for um, uh, painkiller drugs. So any opioids like heroin, for example, those are going to be, uh, what kind of receptors are they gonna be activating a lot? Not serotonin. I mean, it might, I don't know all the details of it, but primarily heroin's gonna be, yeah, activating the dope, or sorry, the uh, uh, endorphin receptors, right? So that's my painkiller slash euphoric slash warm floaty whatever uh, uh, feeling. So in that case, if somebody were to use heroin or any opiate, any painkiller like Vicodin, codeine, whatever, um, they're going to be um, activating their endorphins. All right, so yeah, let's just say they used uh, heroin in this case. And that's not like a bad word in this class. We actually look at individual drugs and what they do as part of the class, uh, as part of the um, uh, curriculum for the AP test. All right, uh, and then, um, yeah, that's gonna be mimicking the endorphin uh, receptors. So as long as they are there, not being reuptaken, not being uh, dissolved, they're gonna constantly activate uh, your endorphin uh, receptors. That, that's exactly what drugs do. Um, so some are agonists. They just mimic it and then they dissolve. Uh, but some are antagonists. Uh, for the most part, antagonists are going to bind to a receptor, closing it off forever, or at least for a very long time. Um, and most of them don't activate it. So let's pretend this was a dopamine receptor. That's partly how happy I can feel. Like if I get a bunch of dopamine and I've got 10 receptors, the max I can feel is you know that 10 out of 10 dopamine receptors. All right, and again, don't forget you have way more than this. I'm just keeping the number low. All right, so again, pretend you got 10 dopamine receptors. All right, so every time you're super happy, the happiest you can feel, that's when you got all 10 of those bad boys being activated. Uh, what antagonists can do is they can go to your uh, receptors, whether it's dopamine, endorphins, whatever the uh, receptor is, the neurotransmitter, they can uh, bind to it and block it so that no more times, uh, never again can, or at least not for a super long time, uh, and sometimes never again, your dopamine cannot enter and activate it. So just what happened to your happiness? It's permanently what? Up, down? Yeah, it's permanently lower than it can be. So now, let's say, because cocaine can do this, uh, it has some chemicals in it that are antagonists that can permanently block your dopamine receptors. That doesn't mean like, uh, well, I'm not going to get the details of it, but uh, they can permanently block some of your dopamine receptors. So there's some famous, like Ozzy Osbourne, for example, uh, he used a lot in his life, and he's blocked so many of his dopamine receptors and others that he's got uh, a lot of neurological issues because of it. Um, he has cocaine-induced Parkinson's? I don't know if it's Parkinson's or not. But he's got several neurological issues just because he's bound up so many of his uh, neurotransmitting receptors that uh, he can't function quite normally. Obviously, he's still alive and all that. Uh, but if you ever watched a show years ago or you've seen an interview with him, like, he's much different. Um, there's, there's a lot going on there in his brain. But yeah, so let's say in this example, this person uses cocaine. Uh, some of the molecules in it are antagonists. <clears throat> they block their dopamine receptors forever. So now, even if they're in a situation that makes them as happy as they can be, the best they could ever be is if it blocks two, let's say, yeah, an eight out of 10. So whatever their happiest moment of their life was, they can only get 80% of that um, from now on. And that's gonna go down and down and down the more you use it, obviously. All right, not all drugs are antagonists or have it in there, but uh, some do. And uh, they are sometimes permanent uh, block of a neurotransmitter treating receptor. 
All right? And most don't activate it too. So once that's blocked, that's just, now you can't be that happy again. All right, and then the more you uh, block permanently, that's the less happy you can feel. All right. That's not so much related to addiction though. Uh, that's more of a future unit, but I, I want to kind of preview it for a second for you. So uh, why would uh, using heroin or cocaine, because these all do very quickly make you addicted to the point that you can't just take it and then when it goes away, you're like, oh, that was fun, and then go back to your life. You actually feel worse until you take it again. That's what addiction is, all right? Why? Why would that occur? It does have to do with these neurotransmitters. Why would those medication, not drugs, or medications, depending on what you're talking about, be so addictive? Why would I need them again to feel not bad? Because when you use it that first time, they start blocking your receptors. Oh yeah, I, I said except for that. You're right, that, that, could, that could be a part of it. But I mean like, uh, um, I don't know if heroin uh, has antagonists, but I do know that one use of it can make you addicted right off the bat. Like it's when it wears off, you'll feel crappy and need it again, uh, at least to some degree. Why? like because you start to get used to it and then like now that it's gone like your body's like wait I still need it yeah okay and in this case getting used to it means your body sort of keeps track of what it needs to make all right so uh, if I'm um, if I'm getting a whole bunch of so for heroin we're talking about endorphins uh, if I'm using a painkiller constantly whether it's heroin or an opiate or, or even if I'm using a bunch of uh, Advil all the time uh, your body tracks that it's like, well, we never even use endorphins because they're always being activated. So clearly we have too many endorphins. Let's just stop making endorphins. So your body stops making your own natural endorphins, right? Because you've just got this medication rolling around in here. So your body doesn't know it's a medication. They think that you've produced so much endorphins that you don't need any more for now. So they cut production of it. All right, that doesn't mean it can never go back. It, it can, but for a period, you will have no or very low endorphin <clears throat> production. So any pain that your body was zoning out, any, any, uh, any euphoria or nice feelings you were having uh, because of your natural endorphin supply, it's gone for a while because uh, your body stopped making them. So when that med medication goes away and your body has stopped production of endorphins on its own, uh, you're gonna feel terrible. Like you're gonna feel any ounce of pain that you might not normally feel or care about uh, you're going to feel aggravated. You're going to feel crappy, essentially, which, of course, is going to motivate you to do what? If I'm feeling terrible because the heroin or whatever wore off, what am I going to really want to do? Yeah. yeah, to go back to feeling that way and to get more. And that's exactly how addiction occurs. All right. And you can kind of see, too, if I've got a ton of receptors for it and it feels just that much better, uh, that makes me more likely to be uh, addicted to it, obviously. All right. So uh, that's kind of how addiction works. And that's how agonists and antagonists work. Unit two is uh, pretty much about how your, your biology affects your behavior. So some of it's genetic, like you don't inherit it, like you know the amount of receptors you have, which makes you more or less susceptible to certain behaviors or addictions. Um, I don't ever want to make you think that like something's set in stone. I mean, the amount of receptors you have might be set in stone, but it doesn't mean that oh. Every person with more dopamine receptors always gets addicted to dopamine stimulation. They don't always, or at least not substances. It just makes you more likely to. All right, so I want you to think of behavior correctly. It's not like genetically determined, where if I get this, it means I'm going to do this. It's not environmentally determined, mean, meaning uh, if I'm brought up this way, I'm going to do this every time, or just because I had this epigenetic effect, I'm going to do this every time. It just increases the likelihood you'll do it. All right. Uh, so there's actually usually a difference in the brain between people that are in prison for violent crimes and people that aren't uh, because certain elements of their brain, which we'll talk about, make them more likely to commit this violent behavior and, and end up there. But again, it's a probability. It doesn't mean that they all will or uh, you know, none of them will escape prison. I don't mean like escape, by the way, but none of them will doesn't mean that none of, no one without this brain feature will end up in prison, because that's not true. But it also doesn't mean that everyone with these features will up in, in prison, because uh, that's also not true. It just makes you more likely to do things or not do things, all right? Okay, um, and it can affect what you like and don't like and what potential you have uh, for intelligence, but uh, there are other factors too, which we'll talk about. So, um, 
how biology affects our behavior. So what so far, talking about um, the endocrine system or neurons, uh, what are some things that could happen in my body, neurologically uh, or hormonally, that could affect my behavior? Could increase the odds or decrease the odds that I will or, or won't do certain things? You can name any. It could be from the endocrine sir, uh, system, could be from the uh, uh, neural system. How might my behavior be affected by my biology? There's a lot of ways to go with this. Uh, like the endocrine system, if you are producing a lot of sex uh, hormones, like testosterone, for example. So if you have like a slope and a lot of testosterone going to your body, you tend to be like more aggressive. Yeah, it makes you more prone to being aggressive, right? So uh, as far as uh, biology and behavior, because that's what this unit's about, how your biology does impact your behavior. Right, uh, hormones can definitely do it, right? So in the case of testosterone, we know that uh, increasing amounts of testosterone make you more likely to be aggressive. Uh, and you, it, not just that like, you think differently, which you do, but you actually see the difference, like they behave differently. You can count the amount of times, you know, mice or animals or people uh, that are uh, experiencing ex increased testosterone levels or are given in, uh, testosterone to boost their levels, you'll see the amount of times, like mice, uh, how often they uh, fight or exhibit aggressive act, uh, actions towards other mice just by injecting them. Uh, can I decrease it and see them decrease those behaviors? Yeah, how do, how do we do that? How do they deal with mice anyway? Someone whispered it. Castrated. Yeah, they castrated them, right. So they lost access to their testicles, so they didn't have their own natural supply of testosterone, and those uh, mice or bulls or whoever, uh, they turned these docile, uh, almost pacifist uh, creatures. Right, so testosterone, hormones. Okay, cool, what's another one that affects my behavior? Increases the probability I will or won't do things. Could be genetic, could be environmental, but as long as it's biological, what could something be? I've given you a bunch of examples, but I mean, those were days ago. Um, like the number of receptors that you have. Like okay, receptors. tell me about that. Uh, so if you have, um, like you just went over, if you have a lot of receptors for dopamine, okay. um, you can, you can be, you're more susceptible to being um, addicted and partaking in acts that cause you to have like rush. Okay, yeah, exactly. Uh, it makes me more likely to do those things. Okay, so if I have a whole bunch of dopamine receptors, I'm more likely to be uh, addicted to activities or substances that give me that dopamine hit, essentially, because I feel it more intensely uh, than they do. Uh, so that can affect my behavior, right? So it could be dopamine or, what, or whatever, all right? It also make me more uh, likely to be addicted to those activities because I constantly want it and need it. Uh, does it mean that I'm gonna be addicted 100%? Not necessarily, but it certainly increases the chances that that'll happen, right? And then the amount of receptors I have is, is for the most part, genetically determined. Um, uh, and again, that has, a, has an impact on my behavior. It doesn't determine it necessarily, but it has an impact on it, a big one. All right, are there any examples we have? Those are the two biggest ones. I give you, I give you more good books for both of those, by the way. Any others? I know it's really on in the class, we haven't talked about a whole lot yet, but is there anything else that could affect your biology that would change the way, could affect the way you behave? More examples? Okay, well, we'll keep going then. So, that's what we're talking about. Uh, I really wanted this one, so as long as we've got that one. Uh, as long as you have an example from hormones, I'm cool with that, uh, but that's, that's a pretty good start there, uh, having those two. Um, so, we know now how a neuron, a single neuron, and I have billions in my body, um, we now know how a single neuron communicates. Uh, so let's look a little bit more at uh, how they actually communicate throughout the body. So first we'll do the nervous uh, system, and then we'll look more at the brain, because uh, I want to talk briefly at least about how genes and environment uh, can actually change the makeup of your brain, and the makeup of your brain uh, can determine uh, or influence things that you like or don't like, uh, or aggressive or non-aggressive behaviors and, and, and all sorts of things. Uh, and what you can and can't do, it's a... Uh, it's, it's quite interesting how important normal development of the brain is and, and how if you alter it in any way, it can really alter your behavior uh, or abilities or preferences or whatever. All right, so here's my terrible human who's overly sized, but it's better because I can draw inside of him. 
All right, and then his, we don't need his feet, but you know his feet are down there too. All right, uh, brain up here, right? Um, spinal cord, right? And that's where most of your bones are connected to. Uh, so you're pretty mechanical as far as like your, your bone structure and tendons. You're pretty much just a bunch of uh, pulls and levers um, that uh, are connected uh, through bone and tendons and muscles and they either contract or uh, expand or, or pull uh, to move you around. But your brain is the one that's telling them to uh, contract or release or, or whatever. Right? So you're, you're pretty damn robotic as far as how you operate. Um, but your brain's the one that gives the commands for like, if I wanna bring my, my fist up here towards my head, um, there's other things involved, but it's mostly uh, your biceps uh, contracting, right? And the, one, the thing that's doing that is my brain is, is telling me to. Uh, do you guys remember what part of your cortical, which is the outside layer of your brain, does that for the most part? Motor cortex, thank you, that's like back in here in this region. Uh, and we actually know that part of the brain uh, handles that. We'll get, we'll get into how uh, in a little bit. But just for right now, know that you got a bunch of bones, tendons, muscles, those all contract and, and relax, and that's how you essentially move, but your brain is sending the signal. So um, when I get a signal from my motor cortex, uh, it's going to uh, travel uh, to the muscle or tendon or wherever uh, and give it the command to contract or, or release or, or whatever. Uh, so the way it goes through is it initially goes from my brain to my spinal cord. And in my spinal cord uh, are a whole bunch of nerves, a bunch of fluids too that, that carry those nerves. Uh, that's kind of where all of the messages uh, going in and out of my body uh, come from and go through. It's like, uh, that's why it's protect. That's why there's, there's literally bone around it to protect it. Uh, creatures that maybe didn't have the bones around to protect it, they didn't survive because uh, those things are too vital to damage. Uh, you damage your spinal cord, you break your spinal cord, not corn. You break your spinal cord or damage it in any way, it can really affect uh, what you can and can't do uh, in your body. Like, you know, if you break your neck or your back, you could be, you could disable your motor functions, which means you can't move your limbs anymore. Or you perhaps you can't feel uh, below your waist or your neck or whatever. Uh, and the reason why is all the neurons uh, that carry the messages out to your uh, limbs and all the parts of your body, uh, they go through that spinal cord, which is attached to your brain, and that is your central nervous system. All right, uh, and it's actually, technically, some people actually lump it in with part of the brain because it can actually act on its own sometimes. We'll get into that later when we get to reflexes. Um, like for example, I'll just give you a quick example. Uh, if I pretend this is like a really hot stove, and I'm like blah 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 blah, and I do that. What am I gonna do instantaneously before I even know what happened? Yeah, my hands go like that, right? Am I gonna go, oh, that's a very hot sensation. I should probably remove my hand from that surface and then take it away. Do I have time to do that? No, because what happens instantly before you even know what happened? Boom, your hand comes up, right? Were you aware of what you touched? Did you have time to think that that, thing, that surface was hot and you should remove your hand from it? But what happened, if my hand moved itself, how did it do that? Yeah, you're actual, uh, you actually have a series of instincts from some past ancestor uh, that actually gets the signal in your spinal cord before it even gets to your brain, before you even notice it's happening, that immediately goes, oh, that's bad, no, no, pull away. Uh, so and that's actually helpful because that little increment of time can mean uh, the difference between like falling into something that would kill you or uh, like let's say you see a, a snake on the ground right next to you, you'll jump before you realize the snake's there. Uh, and that, those little milliseconds where uh, your spinal cord tells you what to do uh, right away, because based on a feeling or whatever, like a, uh, you feel a spider or something on you, the first thing you do is go Whoa, like that before you even realize what the, the feeling itself is. Uh, those reactions uh, are largely embedded into your spinal cord. Because uh, those extra milliseconds you, you got from pulling your hand away from a dangerous surface or getting that spider off you saved a pa past ancestor who didn't have that reaction and got bit or fell into the fire or, or, or whatever, or put his hand on the fire for too long, so then it got burned and damaged and he got infected and he died. But you didn't, because your ancestor went like this, instead of like this, ow. Right, that actually means, could mean life or death uh, for the back in evolutionary history. Anyways, I always thought that was cool. You guys don't seem as amused by it, but I thought it was cool. Uh, central nervous system, uh, it, your spinal cord's a part of it. 
all the uh, signals going from your extremities to your brain go through this. So it's like a, what's the word I could use for this? If you're talking roads, all the streets in Lathrop that go off, uh, usually, and they, they usually dead end, right? Like you, some streets go through to other cities, but a lot of them end up dead ending. Uh, those are kind of like the nerves uh, in what's called your peripheral nervous system. They're much smaller ro roads that usually have only one or a few connections. All right, so those are like tiny streets in a city. All right, not every, not every street in a city can take you to Washington State. In fact, none of them can. All right, they'll all end somewhere. Uh, so those are the ones on your uh, extremes, the extremities. That's called your peripheral nervous system. Okay. But they are uh, connected to the central nervous system. That's kind of like the interstate system here. All right, so if I want to actually go to Washington, let's pretend my brain is Washington. If I want to actually go to Washington, the only road I can really take is I-5, which is right there. All right, so this is kind of like I-5. All the roads connect to it, and uh, in this case, I-5, or in this case, your uh, central nervous system, your spine, that's what goes to your brain uh, and, and gets the message to it. So. Let's use the hand example. I put my hand down here uh, and I get burned. Obviously my spinal cord will get the message back. No, 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 take your hand off and it'll pull it off. But me experiencing that uh, painful burning sensation, that is going to uh, obviously hit my hand. So that will activate the uh, uh, neurons, my sensory neurons. This is how I feel touch uh, or heat or cold uh, or pain. Uh, those will activate and be like, ah, you're touching something dangerous, in this case, hot. And it'll send the signal up the peripheral nervous system to the, what's this central one? Central Spinal cord to central nervous system. And then that'll get the message to your brain. That's how it knows something happened to it. All right, and that's where it has to go. So what if I experience, I was in an accident and a uh, car flipped, whatever, and I broke my neck. What could possibly happen? Paralyzed from yeah, it could be. I'm not talking about movement yet. But you're right, that could happen. What could happen potentially? Um, you could halt the sending of signals from your peripheral nervous system. And yeah, and in this case, I'm talking about my sensory neurons, the ones that feel pain, touch, etc. Because uh, those are different from the ones that move me. And I'll get into that in a second. So, yeah, I could potentially, depending on which uh, pathways I damaged or the whole thing maybe, um, I could lose contact with my peripheral nervous system. So now I just, I can't even feel anything. It's just numb, all right? Uh, that could occur. Uh, they always make fun of them Family Guy. I don't know if you guys have ever seen Family Guy. Some of you are smirking. Or like, they'll like stab uh, Joe's leg because he's he has no feeling below his hip or something like that. Uh, and they always make jokes about that one. But that's what's going on in this fictional character's existence is uh, his, uh, his sensory neurons are not connected uh, in his legs, so he can't feel his legs. All right, and they make fun of that all the time in Family Guy. All right, um, okay. So that peripheral nervous system is my, uh, the extremities, right? And then my central nervous system is the one going to my spine, connected to my brain, uh, my brain stem and my brain. All right, so I actually have a few different types of neurons, and that's, what, that's why I think you said you might be able to move, but I'm like, wait, that's motor, because uh, it's actually different. So one of the uh, nervous systems that's a part of this highway, so think of it like this. The peripheral nervous system and the central nervous system, they're the, the names for all neurons that connect to the brain. All right, so it's like, a, it's like a map, all right? But some of these roads actually do different things, all right, but they're all using neurons. So when I say peripheral nervous system or central nervous system, I just mean all the roads. Do all the roads the same thing? No, they don't, in, in a street, they don't all take the same place. They don't all have the same amount of lanes. They don't all go the same direction. So just like a, uh, uh, a road map, this is my term using for like roads and highways, uh, but they do different things. So one example is my somatic nervous system, all right? So some of these peripheral nerves are part of this system, all right? So peripheral and central nervous system, that's just all nerves and, ner and nerve cells that communicate to my brain. Somatic, I'm talking about specific ones that do specific things. So somatic, I got two that we talk about. First one is sensory. The other one is motor. What do you think my motor neurons do? 
Yeah, that's my movement, right? My voluntary movement in this case. Correct. I forgot to give you guys more to watch the last couple. All right. That's my voluntary movement, right? So if I want to walk like I just did from that spot to that, and I'm pointing and moving like that, uh, those are all signals coming from my uh, uh, motor cortex in my brain, going down my spine, through my peripheral nervous system, uh, and telling my uh, uh, muscles and tendons to contract or relax. All right, that's how motor neurons work. And again, so if I got into an accident and I uh, uh, couldn't move uh, the right side of my body anymore, but I could feel it, is that a possibility? Would I be able to not move it, but possibly feel it? See. Possibly, okay? And that's because my sensory neurons are different from my motor neurons. So these are voluntary movement, all right? Because I'm choosing to walk when I do this, and I'm choosing to move my hands. I might not be thinking about it, but that's become a part of my uh, voluntary movement uh, when I talk, all right? Sensory though, that's how I feel things. And I don't mean like emotions, I mean like actual contact, like my feeling as far as if pressure, so if I'm being touched or not by something. Uh, temperature, whether it's hot or cold or, you know, nothing. But that's also how I, I, I could experience um, chemicals too. So acids or bases, that's actually technically, I didn't know this until I taught the class, that's actually a different feeling uh, receptor than uh, for pain or pressure. But those are the three things I can experience. So, to put it mildly, we'll put this as your sense of touch, all right? And that can be uh, pressure, which is touching you or not, uh, temperature, or chemical. All right, so it is possible, depending on how I'm injured, if I get injured, that I could uh, still have movement of a region, but I could lose sensation. So I could either not feel it at all, or feel it less, or feel it more. Uh, it, 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 can, uh, it depends on the injury that I experience, but that's how it gets there, right? So if I were to somehow go in, I mean, no one would do this, hopefully, intentionally. If I were to go in and be like, snip, 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 and snip some of these nerves uh, and only cut sensory neurons, uh, I might not feel um, this part of my body that's you know, connected. If it was just the arm, obviously, it would stick to just the arm. Uh, but that would cut off my, my sense of feeling uh, in that limb. All right, but I could potentially have some or all my motor uh, movement if I left those motor neurons intact. Is it kind of like when your arm falls asleep? Uh, a little bit, that, that's more so to do, that's actually a reaction by your body. Um, so that's not what you're actually feeling. Like you're not actually feeling pins and needles there. Uh, that's a response by your body, a, an uncomfortable feeling, so you know that you're cutting off a blood supply to a part of you. Because let's say you didn't, let's say that didn't happen. This is a good example actually. Let's pretend uh, if I cut off the blood to my leg because of the way I was sitting, my body didn't make me feel uncomfortable. What might happen if I stayed there for too long? I could lose the cells in my leg. They could die. All right, I could, I could, uh, I could kill parts of or all of my body unintentionally by doing that. Like if I go to sleep and I, and I fall asleep there and, and I don't wake up and I, or no, I wake up, but I wake up and I don't move and I still have the blood supply cut off to part of my arm, um, if I don't have that weird prickly feeling that's really uncomfortable and gets me to move, uh, I might uh, cause some of the cells in my uh, muscle tissue or, or skin tissue or, or bone tissue or whatever, not the bones, but uh, I could cut some of the tissue my uh, arm could die because uh, it doesn't have the blood supply. Mm -hmm. So that's what that is. So that's not you feeling something on the outside, that's actually your, your body going, hey, hey, we don't get blood here, so it makes it uncomfortable so you move it. <clears throat> That happens too sometimes when you're sleeping and you twitch. Uh, that's that's a similar phenomenon where your your body's like losing contact with it and you're like, Ugh, and it'll <laughs> snip me out of it. Anyways, uh, that's your somatic uh, nervous system, all right? And that's, uh, of course, sensory. And don't confuse these two guys. So this is a blanket term for both of these, but they are separate things with separate functions, all right? And I can lose or gain one or the other depending on uh, an injury to my brain or uh, spinal cord or nerves in my peripheral nervous system, mm -hmm. all right? But again, this is where people do get confused because I'm talking about a lot of nervous systems. <coughs> all of them are part of these two because that's just the generic term for all uh, neural systems that connect to your brain. Uh, but now when we get down to the uh, these names here, somatic for example, they have specific functions. 
all right? So these neurons uh, can't do this, this uh, perform that role, and vice versa. If I lose them, I lose them, all right? When I'm growing in their stem cells, they can go any way they want, uh, and my DNA tells them uh, which ones to become. But uh, after that, you know, once I'm, I've grown, you already have it, if you lose those cells, uh, there's a good chance they're just done. Uh, there's a small chance they could repair and, and reconnect, but it's, it's rare and usually doesn't happen. All right, there's another uh, nervous system I have that's very important that's not voluntary. All right, uh, so uh, motor is definitely voluntary. Sensory is not voluntary either because I can't, I can't be like, no, I don't want to feel the pain in my arm anymore and then make it and turn it off. I can't do that. Um, but uh, this is a form of movement, it's activity, right? Feeling's not active. I can sit here, do nothing, and, and I'll feel things, right? Whether it gets colder or hotter or whatever. Uh, but this, I have to choose to move, correct? Mm -hmm. For the most part, uh, or at least if you're talking motor cortex. If I want to get up and move, I have to like decide to do that and voluntarily do that. There's part of your nervous system, though, that uh, actually controls you that you cannot um, control yourself voluntarily. Uh, so there's things we always need to be happening that if we forgot to do them, we would die. You got, you know what it is? Automatic. Yeah, autonomic, actually. There was a typo on the um, uh, notes. It's autonomic, by the way. Autonomic. Yeah, I, I make those notes like a speech to text program, so sometimes it like, I mumble it or it mishears me and it puts another word. That's what happened in that case. Uh, autonomic, if you put automatic, I wouldn't be too upset, but it is autonomic. Um, autonomic nervous system is what, uh, well, what do I need to do all the time that I'm not doing voluntarily? Breathing, digesting your food, heartbeat. You can actually stop breathing if you want. You can hold your breath. <laughs> but what, what are the things that I cannot stop? You, you did mention a couple of them. Your heart um, beating. Yeah, I, yeah, as far as I know, you can't intentionally stop your heart beating just by trying to. Like, you could, you could stop it physically, but, like, you can't be like, all right, and, like, you can't voluntarily <laughs> stop it. Uh, same with digestion. So there's several functions your organs perform uh, that you uh, are being, you, your brain's actually telling them to, to uh, move, but you can't consciously tell it not to. All right, uh, that's the autonomic nervous system. And that's gonna have, handle your, um, how can we phrase it? Involuntary functions, I guess you could say. But uh, if you wanna know some um, examples, of course, uh, digesting, uh, the moving of your food down through your intestines, like you don't do that on purpose, you have no control of it. Um, your heartbeat, you have no control of that either. So a lot of those activities are conducted by um, your uh, autonomic nervous system. All right, and those, by the way, are like in your brain stem, usually. Like the, the medulla and the pons and stuff like that, they regulate those to a large degree. All right, um, and again, those are older parts of your brain, meaning like you have to go much further back to find your common ancestor uh, for that one. Okay, in evolutionary time. So the other, I feel like there's another one I'm forgetting. Oh, uh, speeding you up and slowing you down. Part of this is uh, your nervous system that provides you with uh, excess energy, right? It's part of the whole adrenal gland and norepinephrine. So if I'm uh, stressed out, I see something uh, scary and the adrenaline's released, this will speed up my system. It'll focus me to release norepinephrine uh, and that adrenaline and then cause my body to respond by breathing uh, faster. It'll raise my heartbeat so I have more oxygen ready. So if I need to run or fight, I've got that energy supply already good to go. It like runs you at max essentially. All right, because again, when I'm in a situation where I feel like it's life or death, and again, my body doesn't always know if it's a lion or if I'm just talking to somebody I'm not comfortable with, but whatever. Uh, your body responds the same. If it's a, if it's a stress factor, if it's something your, your brain fears for whatever reason, uh, you'll get that adrenaline, that norepinephrine, um, and to use them, you actually have to have more oxygen in your bloodstream and your muscles to actually run. That's the mechanics of how it works. All right, so that's why when you are scared or stressed or whatever, your heart rate increases. Like you can't tell it not to. Um, you can try to meditate and breathe and sort of trick it into slowing down, but I can't be like, come on heart, I don't wanna, I don't wanna beat so fast right now. Like you can't do that, it automatically picks up. Uh, and again, that's so you can run or fight this thing that your brain uh, fears. Uh, that is part of your uh, sympathetic nervous uh, system, all right? That's the one that speeds you up, okay? So that's the one that increases your breathing, 
involuntarily increases your pulse and, and all that your blood pressure all those things so that you can face whatever the threat is uh, and uh, fight it or run from it all right but again don't forget the part of your brain that activates that is stupid by our standards so it doesn't know the difference between an actual threat to your life and just something that you find threatening like going and giving a speech or uh, you know what, what else might you be afraid of Oh, standing at the edge of a building, even if it has guardrails, you know, you're not gonna fall off that thing, but some people still get like this terror surge of, uh, of, uh, of stress and anxiety uh, because their body fears the height, even though they know they can't fall off of it. You know, so you can't, you can't stop these things necessarily. All right, and if I wanna slow down, if I wanna drain the adrenaline and norepinephrine, and I wanna slow my heartbeat down and all that, what handles the slowing down is the uh, uh, parasympathetic. So the same thing, but just add a para to it. That slows. Speed. Slow. And that's how it works. I'm trying to make sure. I'm, I believe that's, sometimes I swap these in my brain, but I think that's the correct one. Sometimes I have them swap, but sympathetic, the way I remember it is, it's sympathetic to your fear, so it speeds up your system. And then parasympathetic slows it down. So, uh, any questions about those? All right, those are all parts of my nervous systems. Um, and again, all of these are included in this roadmap that is my central nervous system that gets all the communications to the brain, and my peripheral nervous system that carries all those messages to my spinal cord, central nervous system. All right, so now hopefully you can kind of understand a little bit um, how certain injuries might make somebody lose sensation to an area or affect the way they feel things. Um, you can have some bad ones too. Like uh, I know one of my neighbors, when I was a kid, he like fell off a ladder and hurt his spine or neck somehow. And he didn't lose sensation, but it like changed the way the signals were sent and how it was interpreted in his brain. So now he just like permanently felt a burning sensation uh, in his, uh, on his tongue, like, like the left side of his tongue. Happened to my dad too. He had some um, uh, a wisdom teeth pulled out, and when they put the stuff in uh, to numb him, uh, they accidentally nipped the nerve uh, lining in his jaw, and it actually causes it to constantly uh, send uh, like painful burning signals. Not like unbearable, I guess, but what would be considered very annoying uh, constantly. And it's not that anything's happening. It's just that the the part of the peripheral nervous system in his jaw. Uh, or in the case of my neighbor, somewhere in his spine, uh, that would be central nervous system, but they damage the neurons there, so they're sending um, incorrect signals. So even though there's nothing actually happening to them, they're experiencing discomfort and pain, uh, which sucks, obviously. And again, neurons, for the most part, if you uh, break them or damage them, they, don't, they pretty much don't repair, either very slowly or not at all. Uh, so it's not something you want to do. One thing I want to remind you about before you forget all this and, and, and we pack it up here in a second, but not yet. Um, what are my nervous systems made up of? So like, let's take one specific, I didn't hear the right answer, but let's take one specific example. Let's focus in on my pinky fingers. That's gonna be one pinky finger. Whoops, screw it, just the pinky finger. <laughs> they lost the other one, sorry. Uh, this pinky finger. Let's focus on one single neuron that uh, uh, takes the sense signal and brings it to the brain. All right. So this is the one neuron that says that's waiting on my skin to see if something touches it that uh, hurts or is or is hot or whatever. Boom! It's activated and it goes down up the peripheral nervous system and this is going to be a sensory neuron uh, to my central nervous system and the spinal cord to my brain, which then interprets uh, how I felt. What's connecting that highway? Is it one single strand that goes directly to my brain? How does the message go there to there? You guys know this actually. What? There we go, it's an electrochemical signal. So what's making up this pathway then? So yes, I'm using neurotransmitters and um, electricity, but like what's making up this road here? What's the asphalt in the road? You guys aren't going to beat the bell, are you? Neurons. Neurons, thank you. So this is why you have billions of them. 
is uh, they're so tiny you can't see them obviously, and this is a long distance for something that small. So it's just millions of uh, neurons, uh, almost touching, right, that synaptic gap, all the way up uh, to your brain. And that's how they're gonna send that communication. Um, tomorrow, when I finish up this notebook page, we'll talk about the neurons in your brain, how they work and affect you, but that's the nervous system as far as your central and peripheral go. Back it up.